Welcome to the We Hack Purple podcast, where each week or month, we meet a new member of the industry within information security. I am Tanya Janka, I'm your host, and as usual, Bright Security is our sponsor. And this episode, we have Caroline Wong on, and the two of us are going to speak about what the heck is pen testing as a service? But first, Caroline, welcome. Thank you. I am delighted to be here with you. Oh, me too. Will you please tell us a little bit about you? Because not all of our l listeners know you yet. I would love to. Let's see. I am the chief strategy officer at Cobalt. We're a pen test as a service company. I started my information security career 17 years ago, leading security teams at eBay and then at Zynga. I started out focused on GRC, governance, risk, and compliance. And for the second half of my career, I've been focused on application security. I worked for a management consulting company that focuses on software security called Sigital. Sigital later got acquired by Synopsys. Uh, and I joined Cobalt in 2016. And I live in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. I have two kids and four dogs and a cat. Four dogs, wow. Do they herd your kids around? Like, they do. It's funny because my three-year-old is like 40 pounds and our largest dog is like 160 pounds. So there's just like this big size differential. Um, and it's really fun and it's really cute. <laughs> and my husband and I refer to all of them as our zoo. <laughs> I could just imagine like your kids riding the dog and being like, mom got us a horse. My daughter tries and the dogs are like, oh, okay, like we don't really care. We're just going to lay down because they're masters <laughs> and they just, they sleep all day. It's very cute. They're very cuddly. They're like, they're like living blankets. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. Okay, so you wrote a book about pen testing as a service and you work at a company basically leading a bunch of things where everyone does pen testing as a service. So I wanted to obviously ask you a bunch of questions, but before I ask you what that is, what what is pen testing like or penetration testing for people who might not know? Yes. So we have software in our lives and we use the internet. And that software and the internet are vulnerable for a lot of different reasons. And what pen testing is, is when people try and find vulnerabilities in that software so that they can be fixed before they get exploited by the bad people. <laughs> That's such a good definition. I feel like anyone could understand that because sometimes the definitions can get a bit technical and I feel like anyone could understand that. That's awesome. Thank you. I think it's like, I think it's true. <laughs> I think it's true. I, I do think that in security, uh, folks have a tendency to make things seem overly complicated, um, maybe not intentionally, um, but I do think that a lot of security concepts can actually be simple and easy to understand. Yeah, exactly. Well, you used to, and I guess like are already um, speaking at lots of conferences. So, so I discovered her because basically like she spoke at, at all these conferences about things that I'm really interested in. And I was like, Ooh, I gotta, so sometimes I discover someone, I'm like, I'm going to watch all of their talks. And so that is Caroline. Um, and so when I invited her on the show and she said, yes, I was like, yes. Um, so what is pen testing as a service? Because I think yes. of software as a service or infrastructure as a service. So help me understand. So let's go 10 years into the past. Okay. Before, if you needed a pen test, you basically had two options. Option one, you could try and hire a full-time pen tester on your security team. That mm -hmm. takes a while. Uh, it's hard to do. Folks with these skills are in very high demand um, and they're getting a lot of job offers all the time. If you manage to effectively hire a pen tester for your internal team, they're probably getting recruited by other companies um, and they may or may not stick around for a long time. So that's option one. Uh, it's hard to do. It takes a really long time and it's expensive. Option two 
is you call up your local consulting firm and you say, hey, can you do a pen test project for me? And they say, sure, uh, we're going to charge you hourly for this work. And you say, OK, great. That's what I expect. Uh, and they say, but actually, all of our consultants are working on other pen test projects right now. So you're just going to have to wait a little while. And then that little while might be two weeks or four weeks or six weeks or however long it takes. Um, so historically, that's how pen testing happened. Now, if I switch from looking at pen testing and I just look at software development over the past decade, we have seen folks move from on premise to the cloud and uh, we get all these advantages, right? Cloud is lower cost. It's higher flexibility. It's more on demand. It's more redundant. Uh, you can do a lot of workloads. And so that's how we think of pen testing versus pen test as a service. Um, so pen test as a service is like, you need a pen test, you can get it right away. Um, and a bunch of other things that I would love to tell you more about. Okay, yeah, actually, can you tell me more about it? So so when I first learned about pen testing and I was a software developer and I was kind of switching into it, um, so some of the people that first taught me, so not the people who I will tell everyone about as my professional mentors, so those are the people that know what they're doing, but others who I don't name, they're like, oh yeah, you just like press go on a DAS tool and then uh, you just copy that report into Microsoft Word and then you just send it to them and then you charge $10,000. Can you tell me if that's your opinion of how that works? So that is a thing that people do and some people call that pen testing. That is not what I call pen testing. Um, in security testing land, uh, we know that we have automated tools that we can leverage. And we also know that there are some things that only people can do. So there are actual full classes of security vulnerabilities that can only be discovered by humans. These include things like chained exploits, race conditions, and business logic flaws. Um, so any pen tester is going to be using automated tools, but the real value has to do with that individual's creativity, that individual's innovation, that individual's persistence um, in order to find vulnerabilities that are harder to find. Uh, and more often than not, the ones that can only be found by humans are the ones that have a really big impact. Yeah, yeah, that was my findings too. Like sometimes I would do a pen test and I'm like, oh, if you put this piece of information and this piece of information and that one together, the government calls that protected B. And that means we have to actually have this, this and this be more strict. Oh, gosh, I should report that. And, you know, I'd been working as a pen tester like three months. And I was like, oh, I did a thing that the scanner can't do. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. A yeah, super valuable so thing, a super valuable thing mm -hmm. that every piece of software needs. And mm -hmm. between 2013 and 2016, I did this thing called BSIM. I led more than three dozen BSIM assessments. BSIM, for folks who may not be aware, stands for Building Security and Maturity Model. And what I found out at that time, around 2013, 2016 timeframe, was that your typical enterprise with say a thousand software applications was only doing manual pen testing on 10%. 100 oh, yeah. out of a 1,000. And last year in 2021, we did this survey. We asked 600 people all around the world, and we found that folks are doing 63% manual oh. pen testing of their software portfolio. So that's like way better. 10% to 63% is really good. Um, and we're thrilled about that. And we believe that pen testing as a service has made that possible because it's faster to get started. It's easier to yeah. fix vulnerabilities. There's data that you can use because it's structured. Oh, that sounds great. So how, so actually, so imagine I'm a client and I, I wanted to engage. So I don't mean this to sound salesy, but like, how does that work? So previously um, people, people would have to contact whoever I was consulting for, and then they would eventually be like, yo, go over there next week. I'd be like, OK. Um, and so how how does that work so that it's fast? Or yes. is that secret sauce? I don't mean it's to ask not secret, secret sauce. sauce. This okay. is like totally uh, this is totally okay. public information. Okay. Uh, we call our business model a SaaS enabled marketplace. 
So there okay. is this marketplace component. Uh, we have this exclusive and closed group of vetted pen testers. Um, mm -hmm. And these are the folks who deliver the work. None of them are FTEs. They're all contractors that work with our organization. Now we have a software platform. All of this is done in the cloud um, and we sell credits cobalt credits so oh. instead of saying hey let me write a custom statement of work for your specific project we just say hey how much pen testing do you think you're going to need to do this year and then you estimate it you buy credits and then when you're ready to spend a credit you tell us we basically put it on a virtual billboard that goes to our cobalt core community and folks sign up if they have the right skills and the right match and then our team says like yes this is the right team uh, and then you can go and the most typical time period is most folks when they're ready to start a pen test we start them about a week later uh, but we can actually staff and start manual pen test teams within 48 hours whoa okay so i'm gonna ask the most like question that you probably answer 400 times per day but how is this different than a bug bounty program i love that question there are differences between pest pen testing and bug bounty and i do think that both of those methods of defect discovery have value they're just different yeah. value so one yeah. of the things about uh the one thing actually is about the payment how do the security researchers get paid? So bug bounty researchers, only the first person to find the bug gets paid and they get all the payment and anyone else doesn't get paid. Um, in the pen test as a service model, whoever is on that team that gets assigned to the pen test, they get paid for their time. They don't get paid according to the number or the severity of the bugs they find. Um, mm -hmm. There's also uh, kind of this um, less structured model to bug bounty, which is also, I think, part of the beauty of that model, which is to say, everyone just look for stuff. And if you find it, tell us. Yeah. Patent testing has a structure and a methodology. And we say, look, look for the OWASP top 10, look for the ASVS. Like within a team, if you've got an app, divvy it up and divide and conquer and make sure that we're covering all of it. There's an intention to be as comprehensive as you can uh, with your testing. Um, and then I think the, the third piece is that in a bug bounty program, because you've got all of these people looking for stuff and because if they're the first person to tell you about a real bug, they're the one that gets paid. If you're the one with the software, you're getting all these bug bounty reports all the time. And someone has to go through that information. They have to go through it. They have to review it. They have to figure out like what's yeah. what's like really good and valuable, and what's like maybe less good and less valuable. Um, with the pen test thing, uh, these mm -hmm. folks are vetted. Um, they've met a certain standard, uh, and so you're not going to get false positives. You're not going to get a lot of noise uh, with your signal. Oh, that's such an excellent answer. I like how you separate it like from the viewpoint of the employee versus the viewpoint of the customer. That's awesome. Thank you. I, you mentioned the OWASP top 10 and we both, we both are fans of OWASP and um, we were talking a bit earlier and you were saying that you made a course about the brand new OWASP top 10, which is from late 2021. Did you wanna tell us a bit about how you feel it's changed over the years? I would love to. So I started my cybersecurity career in 2005, and the first version of the OWASP Top 10 came out in 2003. Um, I just made a course, it's available on LinkedIn Learning. I would be very happy to make that course available for no cost uh, for any of the watchers and listeners of your podcast. Um, so I'll be following up with you and we'll figure out how to do that. That should be easy. Um, I did this thing out of curiosity where I took the 2021 version of the OWASP top 10 and I put it right mm -hmm. next to the 2003 version. And I was sort of appalled to find out that they're kind of the same. And what that says to me is that for 17 years, we as an industry, the best and the brightest folks in our industry, we actually know technically how to find and fix and prevent these issues, but actually they continue to persist. Um, and I, I looked up something uh, funny, uh, which represents how much time has passed between 2003 and 2021. So in 2003, a movie came out starring Matthew McConaughey. It was called How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Oh, yeah. And in 2021, 
a movie came out starring Matthew McConaughey. It was called Sing 2. He is an animated koala. That's how much time has passed. And in this period of time, despite the efforts of very smart, very technical people working in the field of application security, our list of most commonly found vulnerabilities is like kind of the same. And that says to me that we have an opportunity to do something different. Oh, I love it. I I love that. And I also, I agree a hundred percent how I don't feel our, like the AppSec industry has, has achieved the goals where we've been trying to achieve. Does that make sense? Like, I I don't want to see injection all the time anymore. Right. And I, I did a security assessment late 2021 and guess what? I found a whole bunch of injection. I even Caroline, that company, I found, uh, I found their live banking information in their code. I like called them. I was like, I need to talk to you now. Um, Thank goodness they hired you. Thank goodness they know that now. Yeah, they're actually being acquired by another company that hired me. (laughs) And then they paid significantly less as a result of that assessment. But (laughs) like, so that they have the money to fix it, right? And like, so pen testing as a service would be really helpful because then they don't have to wait weeks and weeks. Like I ended up kind of accidentally stumbling into that job because I was doing something else. And they're like, could you just like, can we just tack this on there? And I was like, mm, okay, I guess so. Um, but usually you can't just like kind of rile up someone right away and being able to hire someone on the spot is, that's really nice. I need to tell people. Um, okay, so I have, I have one more question and then I should probably wrap it up because otherwise I'll talk to you all day, which is what I actually want to do. But anyway, Tanya, behave yourself and ask her questions. So, so I don't know about you, but I get asked about ransomware 24 seven and they're always like, why can't we get a handle on that? And I know my answer and my audience knows my answer, but I want to hear Caroline's answer. Like what, why ransomware, why is that so bad? And why does it keep happening? So I did a talk the other day and it was not a talk on ransomware, but I asked the audience a pop quiz question. I said to them, when was the first instance of ransomware? And it was multiple choice. And I said, was it 2015? Was it 2016? Was it 2020? Was it 2021? I would assume the the earliest one. The answer is 1989. (gasps) I was six years old when the first ransomware attack occurred. Folks were asked, to send $180 to a PO box in Panama. I am about to be 40. Here's the thing about ransomware. And I know that you know this. We could actually make ransomware not possible. You just have to keep track of your stuff, fix your problems, back up your data, and make sure that those backups work. Now, that's not to say that it's easy but it is simple and we Mm -hmm. know how to do it. So this to me is another opportunity. I read a book last year called Mm -hmm. 4,000 Weeks. And the whole thing about that book says, hey, like the average human lifetime is 4,000 weeks. And so what are you gonna do with your 4,000 weeks? I happen to be this year crossing my 2,000 week mark in my life. And I I have dedicated my entire career to cybersecurity. I want to see a change. The first ransomware attack happened when my when I was six years old. And today my daughter is six years old. And when she's gonna turn 40, yeah. I want her to have a safe internet where she can connect and where she can create. I want her to have a safe food supply. I want her to have safe energy sources. This is what I want. And I think we're totally capable of it. It is not impossibly complex. We just have to do the things that we know are the right thing to do. And we have to work together to do that. It is often not the security person who actually has the power to make these changes, to fix these vulnerabilities. We actually have to work with other people to get that done. And that can be, that can be challenging, but it's absolutely possible. Uh, And I'm very, very hopeful about, about the future of our industry. I really like how you pointed out, we need to back up our stuff and then we need to make sure those backups work because practicing rollbacks is a thing that I've seen almost no companies do. And we had a flood somewhere where I worked. And so we lost three days of work. And so when we set everything back up, they're like, okay. And this was back when we, there wasn't cloud. So we didn't have a cloud. So there, so we come back to the office and we're like, okay, 
how many hours is it going to take you to roll that back for us so that we can go from that point forward? And they said, oh, it'll be at least a month or two. And and I was just I was totally flabbergasted. And so sometimes I say stuff I shouldn't say when I'm annoyed with people and I tend to deflect with humor and I was like wow I'm like we're gonna save so much money in the future my boss was like why I'm like because we're gonna let go of those people that do backups because their work is not <laughs> valuable and so we don't need them anymore I can hire like three devs instead of those DBAs that do all for us um and he was like Tanya I know that you're joking but now everyone appreciates that um and <laughs> no wonder it took me so long to get into management making dumb comments um <laughs> No, but it's true. I was like, but their work has no value. And he's like, I need you to talk quieter. I'm like, no, but if we can't roll it back, their work literally has no value. And he's like, okay, I've heard. I'm like, so are we going to practice? And they, so I would pester and pester. Are we going to practice our rollbacks? And they're just like, why does she have to be so difficult? And I'm like, why don't you care? I'm like, yeah. Let's just so, do the things that, that are important. Maybe they're not sexy and maybe they're not fun, but maybe they're super important. And let's just do those super important things. Yes, because then, so like if you're the cybersecurity person and, and you're working with someone and they're like, I don't want to bother practicing my like my rollback once a year, right? Like let's practice once a year. Come on, that's more than zero. And if they don't want to do that, it's like, well, I don't know how I can do my job. Like hey, CIO, do you want to accept this risk that we have no idea if any of this works, right? And they don't want to accept that risk, but when you don't do it, that's what you are doing. You are silently accepting a risk because you're doing nothing and it's... Uh, they, that's right. Thank you, Caroline, for agreeing with me. It's so good. Um, so I am supposed to wrap up now. I'm back for time. <laughs> Will you please tell me anything that the reader should know more about you like how could they follow you on twitter or linkedin or maybe you wrote a book or something i did write a book it is called the ptas book i will send you a link so that you can get your version for free um, i also teach linkedin learning courses on the OWASP top 10 and other cybersecurity stuff and i'll make sure that you have that information Awesome. Caroline also speaks at conferences sometimes, and so you should watch for her name when you see a conference line up, especially if it's something to do with DevSecOps or application security or penetration testing as a service. Thank you. I have a feeling we will see her in places. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it, Caroline. It's my absolute pleasure. I wish we could do this every day. This is so much fun. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Thank you everyone for coming to the We Hack Purple podcast. As a reminder this week, our guest was Caroline Wong and she was so amazing. And we talked about pen testing as a service. We talked about the OWASP top 10 and how it is changed, but not, and ransomware and all her book and so many other things. Thank you so much to our sponsor, Bright Security. We love you guys. And with that, I'm Tanya Jenka. I'm your host and I hope to see you or hear from you at our next episode.